Hey, I'm Alex. I use they, them pronouns, and today we're going to be talking about Nick by Michael Ferris Smith. Uh, so mainly this is just going to be one giant hate rant over this book. So if you're ready to get into some shit, here it is. Uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, the <clears throat> for those of you who know, don't know, The Great Gatsby by F. Scott Fitzgerald recently moved into the public domain, which means that his char like the characters of The Great Gatsby can be publicly used and they don't disrupt copyright, which is how Nick comes into play. Nick is a book which is centered around the narrator of The Great Gatsby, Nick Carraway, and goes into his life before The Great Gatsby. Yeah. My main issue with this is one of queer baiting, and I am gonna go into it, of course, but initially I just want to explain what I'm talking about. So, queer baiting is. Queer baiting is a media, cultural, art phenomena where a piece of media is digested by people and they recognize. <clears throat> Queer baiting is, at its core, when a piece of media portrays something that could be read as queer or something that very much emphasizes that a character is queer without explicitly stating it or by negating it. So for example, you've got BBC Sherlock, pretty primo example of you know, setting the audience up in the development of Sherlock and John's relationship. And this is backed by a long history of people reading the original Sherlock Holmes stories as queer texts or in a queer theory way, and then completely negating that in the show, um, dissing fans who tried to talk about it in that way and just kind of being assholes about it. What stinks about queer baiting, of course, is that for people of the LGBT community, this means one, we don't actually get queer people in texts, and two, uh, people are often like called crazy, like like often fans of something will get gaslit, uh, despite the fact that there's there's an actual substantial reason for this. So in The Great Gatsby, now now I do want to talk about like mild scholarship of The Great Gatsby here because the idea that Nick Carraway is queer is not an old idea. Uh, for a long time, queer theorists and just literary scholars have argued that Nick Carraway is kind of into Gatsby in, in a way that isn't necessarily backed by just being a normal like straight guy or just being somebody who isn't in love with Gatsby. Um, you can see this in the book if you read it. Uh, there are multiple articles regarding it. One of them is uh, the queering of Nick Carraway, I believe. I'll link it down below. But all of them kind of try to discuss how Nick Carraway's actions seem very strange seem familiar if you're not. Nick Carraway's actions seem a little bit off if we're to read him as somebody who isn't in love with Gatsby. Why is he telling this story? Why does he have so much affection towards Gatsby? The general consensus is that he's he's fallen in love with Gatsby's dream, with this this dream of true love, with this overarching like idea that love can conquer all, which eventually fails, but that takes away from the fact that, but that idea gets kind of muddled when we read the text. One, even then, if he's, you know, in love with Gatsby because of his dream, Gatsby's dream is about an overarching romantic 
that Gatsby's dream is about an overarching romanticism that that conquers everything, that conquers time, that conquers destiny, that conquers socioeconomic status. It doesn't make sense why it wouldn't also conquer heteronormativity. But, you know, that's just me. Anyway, when I initially picked up this book, I did pick it up with the intention of wondering if the author was going to actually acknowledge the supposed queerness of Nick Carraway. So I do want to preamble this with, yes, I know that I'm a little bit biased. However, I still think I'm, I'm still going to boof on it because I fucking want to. So whatever. The queer baiting specifically in Nick that I want to talk about, I've like dog-eared some choice pages. And I will say, like, as a general review of this book, um, the first half I was down for. Then the second half got kind of weird, and, and we'll go into that. But the first half of the book is essentially Nick during World War I. So he is in the trenches, and the narrative is interspersed between, like, battles and between his relationship with this woman that he meets in Paris and eventually falls in love with. So his first interaction with this woman, who I might add is like weirdly not named until like a couple chapters in, which is whatever. Um, but his first interaction with Ella, who he eventually falls in love with, um, there is the dialogue. Ella is discussing, she's cut her hair short. And she's discussing how men don't often like that. And Nick says, well, and Nick says, I like it this way. To which she responds, then maybe you are not a man. Maybe you are something different. Now, okay, so this is page 20, 21, forgive me, uh, of a almost 300 page book. And there's already a discussion about sex, sex and gender roles and how Nick doesn't conform to them. Okay, so a couple pages later, page 27, chapter 4, if you're following along, um, he's back in the trenches and they are just... It's just after a battle, and these two men are made reference to. There's like a whole scene about them. And these two men appear to be a couple. So we get this because... Um, because of one of Nick's comrades in arms who says... Out yonder, got two lollipops dancing around like schoolgirls. Looks like they got no idea where they are, or who they are, don't seem like. Hope their pockets ain't filled with grenades. And then it describes the soldiers. The two soldiers skipped and swayed, stopped once and shared a long embrace, and the jeers and whistles multiplied by the couple, but the couple ignored. They held on to one another, seemed to be making some kind of promise. And when they let go and made several more playful circles, and then the one with the missing piece of his skull collapsed to his knees. Sorry, I didn't mention that. One of them <laughs> has a missing piece of his skull. And um, a soldier says, go ahead and gun him, somebody called out. But that was met with disagreement as the men wanted to sh the show to go on, to ni which Nick replies, shoot them. What for, the soldier next to him said. Nick looked at him, the grin on his face as he took in the spectacle, something both grave and childlike in his expression. Nick didn't answer, and he watched again. So, um, I mean, the scene carries on. I'm not going to read it all out, but... Essentially, we've... <laughs> um, essentially, my argument is, why the fuck do we have a scene of queerness in this book that is going to become straight 
or not become a straight, is, is a straight text, is Nick Carraway is not going to be queered in this text. So why did Ferris decide to include, kind of unnecessarily, a passage which distinctly brings up queerness in the military between two men like what what is the purpose of this if not to set the reader up to assume that this will come back later this could have been this level of trauma this sadness could have been done in a straight way and also could have been done in a completely different way void of these characters so so there was the active choice to make a couple who one of them was going to be dying like there was there was that active choice and then to have that choice be two men two soldiers is one decision and then to have both of these men die to have one man die because of his injury and the other to die because he's shot at by his comrades what what is the purpose of this if not to express one the hardship of the queer community during this time and and two if not to lead the reader to assume that queerness is going to be a part of the text like what is the point of these side characters being queer if this is not going to be brought up again and and it really isn't like these are the only queer characters that we get and if we assume that Nick's queer with the, which the text barely grazes on possibly if you read into it but like never never comes to fruition it just doesn't make a lot of sense. Later on, um, Nick also in the trenches. So all of these happen in the span of like the first 60 pages. So we've got like a lot of, in the trench, when Nick is in the trenches, there there's a lot of reference to queerness, um, which, definitely as as a reader myself made led me to believe that this was going to be brought up later so we've already got two going on and now we're going to get another one which is more directly associated with nick as a person so nick is um they're in the forest and they've dug like little like dugouts for themselves for like personal use so nick has like dug his own little hole to prevent him from getting like shot at and this, do, if you've seen Band of Brothers, you know that part where they're in the forest, yeah, the Battle of the Bulge part, like that's how I was imagining it. And this, this other man comes up to his hole and, ugh, and starts talking to him. And Nick doesn't really want to talk because he, he's shy, but um, he starts talking to him. And in the conversation, the man asks, you got a girl? Nick picked up his helmet and set it on his head, tilted it low across his eyes. I said you got a girl. No, I don't neither, and I'm glad about it. Go ahead and tell me why. Not with your attitude. Go ahead. I know you can't keep from it. I'm going back over there. Nick nodded and eased his helmet down farther. I thought you had to talk about something, Nick said. I want to, but it takes two to talk. It takes one to talk. You ain't never been alone much, have you? Um, so essentially what's happening in this dialogue, and this is just like straight up dialogue, which I actually stylistically, I don't actually mind, but if you're not into just straight dialogue, that's another qualm. But so you have this converse conversation, which is, I'm not really sure how you can read it as this man who he's speaking to is straight like like I, I I can't understand how it isn't very clear that he's gay and that he's afraid to discuss this gayness like like it was almost like he was coming on to Nick and then Nick was being dismissive and he cut back you know like anyone would do in a relation well anyone would do when they're coming on to somebody like as like a feeler you know completely normal but why why ferris like why the fuck do you have us like maybe you're not a man two men kissing 
And then, and then this conversation where, where the narrator is directly asked about his sexuality, like it's directly asked if he has a girl at home and it is implied that the other man doesn't because he's gay. Like what is the, what is this? What the fuck is this? So this is all happening, like in like this chunk of the book, right? This whole chunk is like gay paradise. Like, oh, clearly this is going to be gay. Like, I'm not really sure how three separate in instances of queer baiting can lead to a, like a dry ass book at the end. So we've got, I think it's part two. Part two is when he leaves the trenches and he comes back to America. So this is like, a little less than halfway through the book is when we get this other secondary story of Nick dealing with his PTSD by running away from his family problems. This is very Catcher in the Rye-esque, like if Catcher in the Rye was about an adult ass fucking man. And he ends up in New Orleans and he gets in the middle of this lover's spat between this woman who he seems infatuated with and this man who he might also seem infatuated with? Or at least that's how I read it. So um, this is almost a true halfway through the book, he meets Judah. And initially, Nick takes him for a much older man. Um, he, he raised and was out of, out of breath, and while Nick had thought that he was helping an old man, he could see now that he wasn't. He looked closely at the man's eyes and face and saw that the man was no older than himself. Um, so essentially what Nick discovers is that Judah is also a war veteran. He has severe burns, um, severe pain, chronic pain from what he encountered in the trenches. And I, I think what Ferris was trying to do with Judah being a war veteran also was to like f give Nick like a, a way to express his PTSD. However, from my reading of it, you already had two, like the, the only two queer men that we've seen thus far in this book have also been soldiers, have both been soldiers. So we've seen queerness and it's almost been directly associated with the military. Because I mean, okay, so we got the first 50 pages and then a hundred pages later, like Nick encounters a man, right? Like, and so I'm like, okay, so, so he, of course he's a soldier because up until this point in the book, queerness has always been associated with war. Like that makes sense. Does that make sense? Am I fucking crazy? And freaking... So you got this dude, right? And and you find out that he's this young man, that, that, that he's associated with Nick's life, and then all of a sudden, like, his romantic plot comes up? See, this is where I get heavily confused, because the first half of the book was essentially a World War I novel, which I'm into. The second half of the book was very muddled plot-wise. It, it it had a direct plot, but it, it was confusing why the fuck Nick was there. Now, I think you might say, well, Alex, why the fuck was Nick in The Great Gatsby? To which I would say, yes, I don't know either. However, like, it was stupid that Nick wasn't in The Great Gatsby. Like, there was a, there was a, a, a plot purpose to Nick being the narrator of The Great Gatsby and not actually really being a shaker and mover in the plot. Like, like there was a purpose behind it. He, it was artful, you know? This fucking book is named after Nick. Why isn't the plot about him? Like, I, why, why isn't it about him? 
What are you doing, Ferris? Why is the last half of the book just talking about another, like, weirdly doomed love story that is, shall I say, lamer than Daisy and Gatsby's? It's just, it, it doesn't fucking make sense. So freaking after I trudged through fucking 230 pages of this freaking boring-ass queer-baiting book, fucking we get this part where Judah is legit breaking down. So, so Judah is... He's coming to terms with the fact that he has, he wants to die. Like, he, he's wanted to die for a while. He, he, his life is gone. It, it has been taken from him by the war, whether or not he survived it. And um, he's breaking down. And in this moment, uh, Judah reached for Nick and pulled himself into a sitting position. He then bowed his head. So we've got these characters and they're and they're real close. They're they're physically holding like helping each other. Well one of them is physically helping the other up. And while this is happening, while this physical closeness is happening, this is the fucking shit that Nick is feeling. Something opened inside of Nick as he sat next to this man. Something vast and infinite that was without a name, but as familiar to him as his own reflection. And in that moment, he believed that he would never find his place. That as time moved, he found fewer answers and more questions, and all that was behind him was not really behind him, but twisting and turning and keeping him from becoming whatever it was he wanted to become. And he didn't know what that was. Something vast and infinite opened inside of him, and he drifted in that unbounded expanse like, an, like a moat of dust carried for thousands of miles and for thousands of years on the ceaseless wind that wraps the earth again and again. His face fell expressionless, and his eyes became like the eyes of Judah, unfocused and open, only because they had to be. What the fuck kind of straight answer like what, what what straight answer can you give me for that fucking shit have you ever I, i've never like held a friend and been like god no one is ever going to understand me ever in the vastness of the universe and i am but a cog in this great ocean of sadness like what what like even the verbiage Something opened inside of Nick as he sat next to this man. Oh, that seems pretty fucking direct. Like, the fact that he would never find his place. And that something vast and infinite that was without a name. So I don't know how into queer scholarship y'all fuckers are. But one of Oscar Wilde's friends, it was Douglas something or other, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll edit it in. One of freaking Oscar Wilde's friends has a poem um, that is called uh, The Love Without a Name or The Love With No Name. And it is literally talking about gay love here, okay? I, what? How can you... If you're researching the time period and if you're researching anything, really, then what is this without a name if not sexuality like i just i i fucking can't y'all this book one this book is bad like i i didn't enjoy it number two this is like the, this is the most queer baiting thing i have read in a long time like this this really takes the cake like i'm sorry i will die on the fucking hill that Nick Carraway is a bisexual man and you can't fucking take that from me. Like, c Peace.